Cricket Podcast with me, Josh and Lily. Hello. So we have come to the end of the group rounds for the World Cup. Um, the group rounds are over. It is now on to finals. It's, it's been and gone so quick, hasn't it? Yes, it, it really does feel like it's just gone zoom, even though there's been like so many days of cricket. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we've had over Sunday, we had uh, India and South Africa and England and Bangladesh. So we were treated to a full day of cricket there and Tasmania and South Australia. So <laughs> that was a, a full on day, that one. Um, so India and South Africa, that was a very nerve wracking game. I felt very bad for India because poor Deepti Sharma bowling a no ball was it was tough, wasn't it? That was a tough one to watch. Yes, oh, that was just heartbreaking for her, really. And just, oh, no, I couldn't even imagine that. That's, that's heartbreaking. Yeah, it, it was sad. But, you know, for the South Africans, they've been strong. And, and it's going to be a challenge for England, who are going up against them, and see what happens there. But, yeah, on, on the topic of England and Bangladesh, that was a, it was an easier win than I thought it was going to be originally. I thought Bangladesh might have had a bit more of a, bit more of a fight to give um but it just ended up being all over yeah Bangladesh have surprised me this tournament honestly um they've been really uh what's uh how do you say it? a thought in the side of some uh some teams they've just been uh not going away which was good to see actually didn't I, I didn't expect them to make finals but yeah didn't expect them to have the impact that they did so that was very good to see yeah yeah it's been good it, it, I would have liked to maybe see them win a couple more games that would have been a bit more exciting but yeah look it is what it is well, they put it? themselves um, in, a great, in a great position to do that and yeah. easily could have gone either way they pushed the Aussies like they just didn't say oh we're going to give you the win yeah that no, was I thought yeah. honestly I thought honestly we would we would roll over them a bit but no full credit to them they played a great tournament yeah it was a very good game to watch that Bangladesh one where they were just getting couple of wickets there and I was thinking are they are they gonna do it for a moment I was thinking are they gonna are they gonna beat Australia but yeah look it, it didn't happen that way but um you never know I'm sure they're gonna come back bigger better and stronger next year so it's not over for them oh no definitely not and we've got I think we've got a T20 World Cup coming up in the next year or the year after so definitely we'll keep an eye on them in that and I feel a bit feel a bit embarrassed because I uh didn't write off the Aussie girls but I went for New Zealand this tournament and they did not make the semis. So you did. that was a, did. That was a, a bit embarrassing, I will say, but no, well done to the Aussie women. But yeah, I'm disappointed for New Zealand in a home World Cup as well to not, to not even make the semis. That's, uh, that's wow. Yeah, I, I was expecting New Zealand to do a little bit better than they were. And it's, like you said, it is disappointing that the New Zealand fans didn't get that home final experience like we did at the MCG. So, yeah, always next year. Um, it won't be in New Zealand, obviously, but it's just one of those things. Yeah, good. you'll be happy England are through. Uh, yeah, I think I wasn't expecting it from the start whatsoever. They really snuck in there. Um, like you said, I didn't expect them to after the start of the tournament they had, but full credit to them. I'm, I'm just looking at the table now. There was only two points between fifth and sixth, so it's just so tight for that third and fourth spot. One yeah. point between fourth and fifth and sixth. I mean, yeah. it was a game of inches. That's in, that's insane. Yeah, I mean, Kate Cross. She tweeted a tweet. I think it was Kate Cross saying, um, "This tournament is sponsored by nail biters," and I was just like, "That's very accurate." Very, very true. It's every game has just been so close, except for the England Bangladesh one from memory. But like the India and South Africa one, it's just so close. And so unpredictable the whole way through. And I would never, well, Australia, yes. West Indies, I wouldn't have put them in the top four because it was looking like India was going to take their spot. England, no, wasn't expecting it. And South Africa, yeah, probably was, to be fair. I probably was expecting South Africa. But there again, that's, that's the top four. And I was not expecting it to go that way. So it's going to be exciting. The finals are going to be exciting. Um, we'll see what happens. It's a new, it's a new tournament now. Uh, finals yeah. are just doesn't matter what's happened in the group stages anything can happen now so now nah, exactly. excited yeah exactly um now moving on to the WNCL uh the grand final happened and it was Tasmania uh, versus South Australia heartbreaking. it was a disappointing one 
but good on Tasmania because they fully deserve that. Um, Elise Villani, 111, I believe it was, and, and Emma Mannix Jeeves getting 104, not out as well. Um, so I was sitting there just watching two centuries happen one after another. I was nervous for them because I'm like, just please don't get out because you want them to do to get their hundreds when they're that close to winning. So maiden win for, for Tasmania and it, I'm really happy for them. Yeah, no, um, like you said, maiden title, that's, that's always exciting. And like you said, Emma Maddox Jeeves getting 104 and Elise Villani getting 111. And they put on a 205 run partnership. It's incredible. Yeah. That that is just insane. That is yeah. just insane. And that will you can't you can't say anything bad about that. That was just an absolutely fantastic batting display. Yeah. I think uh, I think that's it for our Tegan McFarlane as well. Really, she has retired. Yeah. Yeah, I did see that. I, I saw. I was watching the ceremony. The ceremony afterwards, and Gemma Barsby was asked about Tegan, and and she just started tearing up. So I was like, oh, I think that's Tegan's time, isn't it? But um, no, she's been that's, a solid that's wicketkeeper. Huge. That's that's huge because she's been yeah, like you like you said, a solid wicketkeeper for years, and it's going to feel really different without Tegan there, yeah. um, in the team. It is, and now it's the question of. Who's gonna who's gonna take her spot? Because she has been the wicketkeeper since the second WBBLO season. Because Sarah Taylor was our first, um, and then it's it's I'm thinking possibly um, they're gonna bring in another uh, interstate or international wicketkeeper. I think that would be really good for the team, and it'd be a good mix up. Or they could just um, go the the local option. But personally, I I would be excited to see another a big name from another another country come over and do some keeping for for us you you do have Bridget Pattinson and Josie Dooley as well who are really good keepers as well so they, like you said do they go with them or do they bring someone from interstate or Amy Jones what's she doing yeah. is She's she able to come anymore. over <laughs> yeah. oh there yeah. you go um yeah so who knows who knows yeah. what's happening what's yeah. going to happen there yeah it's we'll, we'll just have to wait and see I guess but um, yeah, look, it was great game from those girls. Um, Tasmania, you couldn't you couldn't fault them. They're just they completely deserve that yes. win there. Now, on the topic of Tasmania winning, a couple of weeks ago we talked to Sarah Coit, who has just been in that team and has just won that title with Tasmania. Um, so we actually did this interview just before the finals. So they were in Canberra still. So we don't unfortunately get to talk to her about the final but it's it's an interesting thing to hear their plans leading up to the final and clearly it paid off because it worked so um Sarah she was great wasn't she she talked to us a lot about um, mental health and the struggles of being in a professional environment and how how to maintain um healthy relationships with sport and eating as well because she was diagnosed with anorexia so yeah it was a, it was a quite a personal personal deep chat but it's 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 a really really interesting one you know Sarah was very amazing the way she talked about all the issues she's battled and how she's beaten them and that was just a great insight on how a full-on athlete can deal with those because she's represented Australia so many times and people go oh they don't they're fine they've got the great life but no it's just fantastic to hear her say the other side of cricket what people deal with so no that was very insightful and um, with her title with Tasmania that is her third one with a different team she's won one New South Wales obviously with us South Australia and now Tasmania yeah she's a she's shirt collecting now as well isn't she she's um (laughs) she's like the dead Christian (laughs) WNCL yeah Yeah. um now just as a as a warning Sarah was on hotel wi-fi so Towards the end, she was a bit jumpy and she did cut out a little bit. But with my amazing editing skills, I've managed to try to piece some bits together. So I hope um, it's clear enough for people to be able to to understand what she's saying. But yeah, so we'll, we'll just jump straight into the interview with Sarah. So we hope you enjoy. Bold Alex Black will keep her up over the stumps and bold. So Coit gets the breakthrough with her first delivery. And Alex Blackwell is out for nine. Welcome. Thank you for um, jumping on and, and agreeing to talk to us. 
That's all right. Sorry it took so long. Oh, no. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. Can you tell us a little bit about where you are at the moment and, and what you're up to? Yeah, so we're in Canberra at the moment um, playing the Women's National Cricket League uh, one day comp. We were meant to still be in Sydney, but well, it's kind of underwater at the moment. So they um, they got us out of Sydney to play two games in Canberra. So we played yesterday against um, Western Australia and we won. And then we've got another game on Wednesday against ACT before we head back to Sydney. Yeah, it's been it's been so all over the place at the moment with the weather, hasn't it? It's probably a bit spoiled. Yeah, it's been it's been really disjointed, but it's um I know I know they got a couple of overs in um Sydney yesterday between Queensland and South Australia. So and that's quite remarkable to get them even on the field in the first place. So um I know that the games on Tuesday, um, well tomorrow have already been like abandoned in Sydney, which from um from a points point of view is not the worst thing in the world to happen for Tassie. So um yeah there's been actually a few severe weather warnings issued here in Canberra so we're on a bit of high alert over here to see what's coming our way so um I guess we'll have to adjust and see what's going to happen well currently the uh sun is really shining here in Adelaide so just all come back down down miss Adelaide just come back down to Adelaide just I know I know I'm trying to get back there I need to get back there (laughs) um but you yourself have been doing really well so far so Tasmania have obviously won their first two games and you got player of the match in the first so um what's it like to get back out there and and play for Tasmania and, and do so well um, it was actually quite unexpected to do as well as I did, considering I haven't really picked up a bat since December, I guess, was the last game I sort of played. So um, it's actually a really fun environment to be in with the girls, like um, out on the field. It doesn't it, – it's cricket, but it's it's just fun. It's just you can play with freedom, um, and I kind of just get to go out and do my own sort of thing. Um, and that's really cool because, you know, back in the day it wasn't really – like that there was a lot of pressure put on by mostly yourself and um, a bit of like from a selection point of view so to be able to go out and just play with freedom knowing that I haven't really done a lot but trusting that I've done enough in the past is really cool and you now obviously you performed really well with the bat so do you now get to go around and, and call yourself an all-rounder is that something you you enjoy doing now? let's not get too carried away <laughs> uh, <laughs> no nah, I, I don't mind batting I don't I don't mind batting when I get out there, but if I do have to put the pads on during the game, I often think, geez, we're in a bit of trouble here. <laughs> no, well, it seems it seems to be working out, doesn't it? You um, managed to pull some really good scores there, but we'll go right from the very beginning. So how did you first start playing cricket and, and getting involved there? Uh, I have a twin brother and an older brother who both um, played as juniors um, and they both went on to play Um, some Big Bash actually for Sydney Thunder when the Big Bash first came about but I sort of just followed in their footsteps um, you know having older brothers having the backyard cricket and all the boxing day tests and all that sort of stuff so um, we kind of just grew up playing junior cricket um, and then sort of when I was 14 the under 18s it was called Brewer Shield in um, in Sydney that sort of that competition came about so I started playing in the under 18 stuff and then from there sort of progressed up um through the the New South Wales underage pathways and into their um New South Wales system I guess um before I moved to Adelaide to play for them have you ever played any other sports or has it just been cricket uh no it's mostly just been cricket I I sort of played all year round so in the winter I would play indoor and then kind of hang out for the summer to play um to play outdoor so it was I mean you dabbled in a few different things at school but predominantly it was just cricket did you have any cricket idols growing up Uh, I always loved Ricky Ponting always a huge fan of Ricky Ponting but um, in all honesty I didn't really know much about female cricket back then Um, so to to say I had a a female um, sort of player to look up to I if I said I did then I'd be lying because I didn't really know anyone so um, it was more from the men's point of view, I really um, liked Ricky Ponting and the way he went about the game. So he was always probably number one in, from my perspective. So now that you know, you've been on the scene for quite some time now and you've played your fair share of uh, Big Bash, you mentioned before that you didn't have any females really to look up to. Now that you know you are 
quick bowler and, and you're on the TV, how does it feel to now be in that position where young girls can look up to people like you? How does that feel to you? Well, thanks for calling me a quick bowler. Um, <laughs> no, too modest, Quinn. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, mate. No, it's um, it's really cool to see how far the game actually has come, and to um, to have people somewhat recognise you. Um, I mean, they're the diehard fans, to be fair, but to have um, young girls say, "I want to play like um, Meg Lanning or Sarah Coyd or whoever it might be," is is really um, quite different to back when I was playing New South Wales and Australian stuff. No one really knew about female cricket at all. So it um, it's actually incredible how far it's come in sort of like a ten year period. Uh, it's a, it's a very cool thing to experience. You played for the Strikers right from the very beginning. Uh, so, so the men's one had been going for a couple of years before the women's one started. So how did you feel when, if, if you remember, how did you and the team feel going into the first ever tournament or game, in fact, and just going out there and playing? How did you feel then? Uh, we were actually, I remember feeling nervous. Like T20 back then for us was still like quite new and we were still trying to figure out the format and how to play it and how to go about it. So like, you would have seen scorecards back then and seen teams getting bowled out for 110 and us thinking in 20 overs, like that's a really good score. Um, And you look at the scorecards nowadays and the minimum is usually around 140, 150 runs. So um, back then we were still like quite nervous and quite fresh to the whole 2020 scenario. um, Just trying to figure out what's a good score, what fields, um, how many overs should we bowl and when and, it was, it was just more of like trial and error. <laughs> so it was a bit of Russian roulette a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, with each game, we sort of learnt more and more. And now you can see like with the World Cups and how like big the Women's Big Bash is now, how far the game has come in those sort of in that seven year period. I think this is BBL 07 we just played. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you can kind of, I'm sure if you were to sort of compare scorecards to back then, um, to now like you'd see a huge difference um, in both batting and fielding or bowling innings anyway. I, de- I have actually definitely noticed that I was looking back at one on uh, WBBL2 and just comparing how far the women's game has come since then mm. yeah you, like you said it is definitely comparing scorecards to then it's great to see how the women's game has evolved and how the players have evolved it's fantastic. Yeah it's so interesting to hear you say as well that it was just trial and error and you didn't know really about any of it because now it's probably just a thing that you don't even think about because it's seven years into it now so it's just you know who the teams are you probably don't know new internationals but you know most of the teams and you know how the teams play so at the end of WBBL02 you retired and then you uh, came back towards the back end of WBBL03 to play for the Sixers and it's fair to say that you had quite a good couple of games there you got in the grand final you were um player of the match and won (laughs) won it with the sixes so um how did that feel I jumped on the bandwagon didn't I (laughs) (laughs) Um, it seems so long ago when you say BBL 03 and it's 07 now um it seems like a lifetime ago um but yeah it, it was very random that I jumped on the back end of that um of that big bash I remember I was living in um, Sydney in a place called Janelli at the time. And I had a missed call from Ben, the coach. And I called him back and he said, um, would you fancy playing a couple of games for the Sixers? Like we've got some internationals that have to go back and, um, you know, we need, we need a hand. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll I'll come in and have a bowl. And then he's like, all right, so we play on this day. I said, oh, you actually want me to play? And he's like, yes we want you on the field I was like oh I thought you meant just like be around the group and like run the drinks um and he's like no 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 like we need you to play and I was like oh okay well I haven't really bowled for about 12 months but sure yeah let's go (laughs) so it was it was very random but um yeah at that time I was in a much better place like with my mental and physical health where I, I felt like I could sort of be back in that environment um and it yeah it turned out to be a decent four games yeah, jumped on the winning bandwagon games. <laughs> yeah <laughs> evidently yeah <laughs> no I remember that um I was an honorary Sixers fan just uh because um yeah it was it was so cool to see two different teams actually play in a final at Adelaide Oval so yeah not many times that happens so it was really cool it was it was cool because like 
obviously the um, the men were playing and we were sort of mirroring their um, their schedule. And you know, it's cool to have a standalone comp, but it's also it's cooler to play before the men on New Year's Eve at Adelaide Oval with a packed out crowd and you get the after party, you go up onto um, the oval top and you look out onto the bridge. Like you kind of miss all of that, um, having your standalone comp. I mean, it's great, but still you do miss the the hectic schedule of following the men and having a bit more of a big crowd. Like we had some really good crowds this year, but still that sort of that New Year's Eve and that Christmas period was like a lot of fun because everyone is, it's not often you have a lot of people holidaying around October, November type um, right Very before true. Christmas. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it is great that we do have a standalone, um, but yeah, you just sort of, you can't really go past a packed out Adelaide stadium on um, New Year's Eve, can you? No, it's the best state. Yeah. It really is. It's I, a- yeah, I love it. And I plan to go back there one day very soon. Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's everyone's favourite, I feel like. It's got to be. It's one of the most beautiful places, one of the most beautiful ovals in the world, I'd say. But when the men and the women's seasons were together, it feels like, from what I remember, is majority of the women's games then meant that they were at Adelaide Oval. And now what I've noticed over time is that now that they're standalone, a lot more of them are being played at Karen Rowland. So there are occasional ones at Adelaide Oval, but most of them are at Karen Rowland usually. So yeah. do you think that's maybe worked against the whole development of women's cricket, whereas there's no seats really at Karen Rowland, so maybe that turns people away? Is that something that you think is, is different? Um, I, th- uh, I, guess, I guess in a way you could sort of look at it like that, but I think from like their marketing perspective, I think it's more um, accessible for people uh, in terms of like it's so open um, and people like walking through um, to go to McDonald's or the server or whatever or people driving past, they can kind of see that a game's on um, and it's not as as difficult to sort of turn in, park your car versus getting to Adelaide Oval and all the parking and all that kind of stuff. So I guess like from a like a, a community standpoint and trying to engage more people to get there. I think the openness of it is good um, and it's not as big a space to fill. Um, so if there is a few people there, like a couple hundred, maybe it kind of feels like it's a better atmosphere almost. Yeah. So yeah. in a way, you know, like I could see it from both points, but um, yeah, there's sort of the, there's not as many games on the oval as we would like to see, which is a shame, but um, it's nice to have a decent crowd at Karen Rolton when the games are scheduled on a weekend or um, like a Friday night or whatever. Oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. That's a very good point. You, you, um, you made with uh, the openness of the ground and yet yeah, I, I think I've been driving past or on the bus past the oval and I'm like, Oh, there's a Toyota future seconds game on. I didn't know that was on. <laughs> And to see it, there's always, yeah, if you just see it, you're like, oh, what's going on there? So, no, that is a really good point. I never thought of it like that. Yeah, no, neither did I. Do you uh, prefer playing at Karen Rowland or Adelaide Oval? Do you have a favourite? Oh, you can't really beat Adelaide Oval. I think no. yeah, if you were, if you were to ask me where would I play any game of cricket in the whole world, like even over playing at Lords, I would pick Adelaide Oval. Wow, that's a... <laughs> I mean that's good, but that's um, it's, it's, yeah, interesting. One. It's a Adelaide, big call. Adelaide. It's a big call, but I just there's something about Adelaide Oval. It, it Adelaide just, Oval is such a yeah, such a picturesque oval. Um, yeah. There's not. I haven't been to every single ground in the world. I will someday, but it's um. There's nothing else like it really. Have you Believe watched it. a footy game there before? I have. I've my first ever live game was Crows versus GWS. Um, and it, I think it was maybe three years ago now, um, but I loved it. You can't, like, I've never experienced an AFL atmosphere and it's it's unreal. I can't yeah. wait. I'm going to be at a few games this year, hopefully. Oh, amazing. Crow, yeah, Crows fan? Yeah, Crows fan. Yep. There you That's go. Right, you've spent enough time in Adelaide, so wouldn't expect yeah. anything like exactly. <laughs> We have claimed Sarah Coy, yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're our... Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess going back to um, when you played for the Sixers, to kind of come up against, well, not be in the Adelaide team anymore. What was that like? Was it awkward? Did you feel awkward at all? Because Adelaide's your, your second home, you know? 
yeah it, it was um when he when Ben the coach mentioned that the last two round games would be against the strikers I said of course they are like why wouldn't they um I felt I thought it was like pretty comical actually um I didn't find it awkward I just kind of uh, I was just like conflicted <laughs> yeah it's, it's kind of like you know we're playing for um or they're playing for a spot in the final and you know we're already in the final so it's like either way I don't really mind what happens but you still got to go out and do your job so um it, it wasn't too awkward like it was really nice to see all the girls and stuff again and, and I low-key wished I was in a blue shirt but what do you do well you're back in one now so it's okay it, it all worked out in the end it's like it was meant to be um, but it's just a bit funny that the coach um left that out of it at the beginning didn't he he didn't tell you that that you were going to be uh not until I said yes <laughs> <laughs> left that bit out so when you um when you played for the Scorpions and the Strikers and then you went back to Sydney and then to the Strikers how it how weird was it like because you kind of did the loop round um at first it was just weird being in a cricket environment full time again um, but in terms of like being around the group and stuff, like I think for the most part, everyone was pretty happy to have me back on board, which was nice. Um, so transitioning back in was fine. Cause when you've got a group like the strikers or like the Scorpions girls, strikers girls, it's just, it's so easy to just slide back in. Like everyone likes everyone's company. We're all good friends. It's, it's a really good environment to be around. As well as the team, I think all the all the fans were all very happy to have you back as well. I can say that was definitely a... After seeing you win for the Sixers there, we're like, oh, yeah, we're glad we got it back on our side now. <laughs> Player of the match. <laughs> got it back. Of course, of course, we were hoping you would do well in Sydney because yeah, 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 yeah. you were with sure. us. And we... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Only yeah. you, only you, no one else. Stuff everyone else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so can you talk us uh, a little bit about what happened when you retired at the end of WBBL02 and how you came back into the sport? Yeah, so at the end of BBL02, I think that would have obviously been the same year that I didn't take my Cricket Australia contract, probably. I don't know, they kind of all blow, blow into one, but the reason why I stopped is still the same regardless. Um, I was diagnosed with an eating disorder, um, anorexia nervosa, in my early um cricket Australia career so for the majority of my playing days for Australia I was like sort of battling through that um eating disorder the entire time and it got just got to a point where I just got fed up with um all the travel and all the anxiety that it brought to my eating my training all that kind of stuff so I just uh had to sort of put my mental and physical health first and look for some stability and some sort of a bit more routine to my days um, and, and being in the one place. And I really had to work on my relationship with training and food before I actually felt like I would be in a better place to do anything really. Cause it got, it got to a point where I was making excuses to not even go out to dinner or anything like that. So I became pretty, um, pretty introverted. Um, and that just sort of wasn't like my personality that, um, that, I just wasn't the person that I once was so I had to take a bit of time out to really work on getting myself back to a point where I was okay to be in social settings without like having a panic attack yeah and then you came back to the sport was it a bit sooner than you expected maybe yeah yeah it was to be honest um a lot sooner than I sort of anticipated and, and when you sort of walk away um, or, or leave the sport like I didn't actually anticipate coming back I thought I was done um, but it just so happened that Benny called and wanted me to play and I thought oh yeah I may as well like I'm in a better headspace I'll sort of it was kind of like at the start it was more like can I conquer the demon um, because it was like oh if I can get through a couple games then like I'm, I'm winning like I know I'm on the right track so that's what it was at first and then um, to have the performances I did, I thought, okay, well, maybe I've still got a bit more in the tank. And if I keep working on my myself mentally and physically, then maybe I can still play at a higher level um, just with like less pressure on myself to perform. And that, that's the hardest thing for any cricketer, I feel, is like, yeah, you put so much pressure on yourself 
And if you're juggling it and don't know how to do it, you just know you're not going to succeed. And that was very good to you that you were that you were aware of it. And it's really good to see you back playing the game that you love. Yeah, I mean, we're we're all our own worst enemies, really, and our harshest critics. So, and it just felt like they like I could never be satisfied with my performances or my training or anything. So to get to a point where I was okay with like trusting what I'd done and all of that, like that was huge, and that was the big breakthrough. And that's why I'm able to play now and play with the freedom that I play with these days. Like I, I don't really train for cricket anymore at all. I, we have training tomorrow. It's optional. I'm going to opt out. I'm not going to train for it. The more I train, the worse I get. So if I walk in with a clear mind and I think it's just another game of cricket that I've played for 20 years, then I can just do my thing. Um, and it's the same with Big Bash. Like I don't train all that often for it. I'll bowl two weeks or a week before our first game and that'll be it. Yeah. Like you said, that's uh, that works for you. And yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, did you have any, any like uh, strategies that you used when you first took your break to help cope with anything? And do you still you use them now? Um, strategy wise, I, I obviously had a few different sort of psychologists before you find the right one. Um, medication helped a lot to sort of um, stabilize my hormones and things like that. So my last resort was medication. I always thought that it would like change who I was but evidently it actually leveled me out um so the chemical imbalance is now sort of stable um and it just it sort of helped me feel more like me which was funny because I thought it wouldn't in in the first place but it's more um I I really had to focus on my relationship with training because that's where it all started to go downhill so I really had to educate myself there um, and look at what I was doing versus what I needed to do. Um, so I sort of educated myself around like the training um, and the food. Uh, and then it was just, I got myself a coach um, to help me sort of say enough's enough. This is your training for the day and that's it. Strategy wise, it was more like just keeping myself grounded and calm and in a, in an environment that didn't, um like sort of trigger me or anything like that so that that was kind of the hard part was um staying away from environments that could trigger me but yeah I think I I didn't really have too many strategies like I wouldn't go sit in a corner and sort of like take 10 minutes out or anything like that it was more like the restructure and reprogram of how I needed to go about being an athlete or letting go of the athlete lifestyle and being just a person who plays professional sport every now and then type thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And it's very good to hear you talk about that and just just how it affects different people and everyone just needs to go at their own pace and mm-hmm. really look after themselves. And I know some people are good with other people around them, but sometimes people just go say, no nah, stuff, I just need to figure it out myself. And yeah, that's yeah. really good. I have those days too. Like I really enjoy like my PT life and being around my clients and stuff like that. But, you know, at the end of the day or of a weekend, if you've had a big week and like the last thing you want to do is be around people. But, and that was one of the the hardest things I had to learn is when, when I had my downtime, that was usually the, the time that I would self-destruct if I wasn't around people. So it was learning how to be okay on my own um, and sort of, reframing what I did in that time instead of like being myself up it was like I'll read a book I'll do something that you know kind of keeps me going along keep my hands busy my mind busy stuff like that just being okay on my own without actually anything to do um, that was the hardest part but we got there yeah and and you mentioned uh, personal training as well was that something that yep. came into it during that process or something that's that's come afterwards uh, it sort of came maybe, I was sort of more around 2015, 2016. So it was sort of towards the end of my playing career. Um, well, actually, when I retired from uh, Australian stuff, I sort of said I wanted to, to PT and coach because if I could help someone not go through what I went through then I would you know be a happy human so that was towards um, me sort of somewhat coming out of it I didn't really come out of it fully until probably 2019 even maybe 2020 borderline there was still a few 
um, relapses here and there, but for the most part, um, that was sort of environmental as well. Um, so sometimes the wrong environment just triggers it. Um, but now it's much more under control than like I could have ever imagined. That's really good to hear. That's really yeah. good. Yeah, and it is so good to hear you be so open to talk about it because that can really be such a changing point for some people. And I think the way that you've you've overcome it is, is so brilliant. Um, so let's talk about Australian stuff for a little bit. So you're quite a, an experienced Australian player. You've played four tests, 30 ODIs and 40 70 20s. So you've got quite a, quite a lot of experience there. Do you mind just talking to us a little bit about that and what playing for Australia is like? Yeah, so I guess like from a, a young girl starting out playing cricket to finding out you actually could play for Australia was um, something very cool that I just didn't think was even possible. So I guess like the old cliche is like the dream come true. Um, it's the pinnacle of, of your career, I guess, um, in any sport really to represent your country is you know the pinnacle it's like you can't get much better than that so to be in that setup and that pathway to where it's at now where females are being paid full-time they're getting endorsements there's multiple competitions around the world now is um is something very cool you made your Australia debut uh against England so what was that like to really I guess that's like the main the main thing is Australia versus England so what was it like to be involved in that was this my one day debut? Yeah. I'm confident against New Zealand. According to the reliable source, Wikipedia, 5th <laughs> of January 2011 v England. Oh, really? <laughs> Last ODI was against New Zealand. Cody, you'll probably remember the T20 international debut was against New Zealand. There you go. Do you remember anything uh, about that one? Against New Zealand in New Zealand? Because I think I might have got player of the match, but I can't remember. Anyway, to debut, very cool, very nerve-wracking. Um, but to actually see a name on the back of an Australian shirt um, with a number there and knowing that it's yours and all of the hard work that you've done, the long hours of training, like it's it's right there in front of you and you're about to go out onto the field and play the one game that you've been playing for years, but you finally got that Australian shirt and it's it was um, it was very cool. And, I'm you know, I'm pretty upset I don't remember it, but... All the days blur into one, but with respect to the game, like it's it's very cool to put on an Australian shirt and have your name on the back of it. Yeah, and and you, you know what? Um, we can't blame you because you played so many of them. So honestly, it's <laughs> it's completely understandable that you don't remember the first. <laughs> did you um? Did you get to choose your number at all? Uh, I think I had a choice between a couple. I wanted twenty one, but Jess Jonathan wears twenty one, so. Um, because of my uh, ADHD tendencies, I do everything in three, so it just had to be a multiple of three. So I chose 15. I think 21 is such a popular number on the back of cricket shirts. So many people yeah, want you one. <laughs> yeah. So you played your last test in 2015 in England against England. Uh, your ODIs and T20s followed um, a year after that one. Uh, so, so what was it like? Do you remember anything about playing your last Test match? Yep, that was, uh, we won that game, didn't we? Yes, yes we did. Yeah, we beat them. Yep, I remember because we went out after. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do remember that. And it was, look, test matches are like, they're more a mental challenge than anything. Like it's, it's a long day out in the field. Um, waiting for something to happen I guess because in a way England were playing for the draw in that game um and it was it was honestly boring cricket it was boring um until Elite breakthrough and got Lydia Greenway out like it was just we were just waiting for something to happen um but to play test match cricket was very cool it's honestly not my preferred way of playing I prefer T20s because it's over and done within three hours but um to play a test match for Australia it was it was very special you know you don't you don't get to wear the baggy green often um so to put that on and, and be out there for a couple of days and to actually win and beat England in England was was pretty big you got out the same person twice do you remember 
who that was? No. No, <laughs> you don't remember. <laughs> no. Well, well, it's it's a pretty you sh- once. Well, it's Heather Knight, and I think you should be um you should be pretty proud of that I one. Her out. <laughs> I remember I got her out um in a maybe it was a one day or a T twenty game, either one, but. Um, I got her out and that same ball, she hurt her hamstring. That was when she had that really bad hamstring tear, I think. Oh, Ooh, was it that one? <laughs> mm. Ooh. Yeah, she yeah, I remember did. that. Yeah, do you remember? Yeah, I remember that, yeah. That was yeah. a very bad tear, hamstring tear. She was like out for a while. Because I thought she missed the ball. Turns out I got her out. <laughs> yeah. What is your favourite cricket memory? Do you have just favorite cricket memory ever yes it is we were playing the ashes and we were I think in Brighton it was the night we won the ashes back and we were in England it was a it was a t20 and we only put a hundred and something on the board I can't remember how much we put on but it wasn't it wasn't a lot but we ended up winning that game and winning that game meant we won the ashes back um and that that was unreal to win it back on um, English soil, um, and that was also the same night slash early morning that my brother was getting married. Oh. So oh. yeah, so we <laughs> into this wedding ceremony. <laughs> but that that that's probably up there with one of my favorite um, favorite memories for sure. Yeah, it's, that's, that's I feel like. Memory. That's probably it. for to be involved in an Ashes is quite memorable for most people, I'd say. Do you have a, a favorite wicket that you've ever taken in particular? One that will always you'll you'll be like, I want to bowl that ball again. Um, well, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't think so. I think anytime I get a wicket, I'm pretty happy because when I let it go, I'm like, what's gonna happen? <laughs> <laughs> kind of like I hope you know, I hope they hit it to the fielder, you know, like um it's not really I don't I don't think for me it's it's more like um any sort of moment personally that stands out it's more like the team moments that stand out um but I mean if if it did come down to a moment personally when we played the Bangladesh World Cup final I remember I I got um Charlotte Edwards and Sarah Taylor out in that final and um those two the big match that was um that was pretty cool those are two big names to get understand yeah. that's that yeah. that would be awesome yeah, yeah I, I do remember that yeah how was it playing premier cricket in adelaide for the mighty sturt district cricket club <laughs> it was fun it's just fun just a little just hit fun. out just a little sunday run around with the girls um good social banter some some days were long days, as you can imagine. But uh, yeah, in um, it's the same thing. It's like it's like in any Adelaide team. It's just environment. Like they're just they're just fun to be around, you know. And if I was to play cricket again in Adelaide Premier Cricket, I would go back to Sturt. Oh, good! Um, it's, a, it's a good Premier club. Megan shoot players there as well, doesn't she? Or, or she did? Yeah, yeah. Megan no, Megan and Alex. Yeah. Um, yes. So do you have any plans on returning uh, to the Strikers anytime soon? Or is Yeah, that- yeah. I'd love to play for Strikers again. Like it, I, um, I would find it incredibly difficult to play for another um, franchise. Uh, I would much prefer to be in blue. So if they want me back, then I will be signing that contract. Well, that's that's good news to hear that you're not like, I'll jump over to sixes again. <laughs> I'd know. No. <laughs> I'm a striker girl. I would sure. honestly rather play if I don't get to play for strikers, I'd rather not play. Well, that's that's something, that's isn't what, it? I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, we're okay with that one. We're okay with that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm at. So um, I don't know if you have thought about it, but how long left in the tank do you think uh, in the uh, WNCL when in the t20 well honestly it's up to my body <laughs> it's up to if it can handle it like um i thought i would the last two games we've played i've had to bowl 10 overs both games and um i and i i've batted for a bit of time in one of them and 
I've actually pulled up a lot better than I thought I would. Um, and, you know, I'd probably pull up better if I did train um, cricket specific. Like I'm in the gym all the time, but if it was cricket, cricket specific, I obviously wouldn't be as sore and, and things like that. But ultimately it's, it's up to my body. Um, if my back and my shoulder, if they can handle the load, then I'll keep going. Probably maybe, what am I, 31 this year? God, um, three years. Oh, God, tell that to my back. Um, <laughs> probably, probably three years, maybe, I would say. Well, I look, it's not like you, you look like you were really finishing anytime soon because you still look just as good as new out there. And, and you never know, you've got, got Swami, who's, I think she's 39, oh. and shows um, Jimmy oh. Anderson as well. So, uh, yeah, so, well, <laughs> got a bit of time. But look, yeah, we'd we'd love to have you back, absolutely. Um, I'm not, I'm hardly the coach, am I? But we can, I'm sure we can yeah. pass on a pass on a message. So to finish off, we have got some this or that. Now this is Josh's. Uh, Josh takes charge of this bit. <laughs> All right. So for the this or that, cardio or weights? Cardio. Cardio. <laughs> <No threat. laughs> morning, morning or night? Morning. Morning. I uh, put uh, I put 2020 or test cricket and you answered that. You answered that, yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Instagram or Twitter? Instagram. Okay. Uh, coffee or tea? Coffee. Coffee. Pie or sausage roll? Oh, pie for sure. Ooh. Pie. <laughs> what what kind of pie? Just a meat pie with some tomato sauce. Can't None go wrong. That. None of that fancy chicken and leek or potato and yeah. Like that. Oh, they just ruined a good thing, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, another one answered Adelaide over or SCG. Adelaide is. I hate Adelaide. the SCG. <laughs> <laughs> you say that? Like that? I don't like it. Frank, play on. I just don't like it. Well, okay, fair enough. That, fair enough. That, is all, that is all good. <laughs> yeah. Um, take taking a wicket or hitting a six. Oh, hitting a six. Hitting a six. Yeah, it is pretty good. To recover, ice bath or running. 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 Yeah, ice bath. I can't stand being cold. I hate it. I luckily have never had to put myself through an ice bath, but I can't imagine them being that pleasant. I I seriously can't. They're okay. Oh, they're yeah. stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your body number aren't they <laughs> yeah bad. it's actually and you come out and you're actually red yeah yes yes and I itchy about, i found myself itchy yeah i, I don't like about, it i heard something about socks like apparently if you wear socks it makes you feel yeah. like it's mentally makes you feel like you're warmer or something like that is that is that well, i'm gonna do that now <laughs> yeah a lot of people do parade around with their socks um from the ice baths Whatever helps. I just don't. Just don't do them. This is the solution there. I just don't do them. <laughs> probably, um, probably just one final question for me. Um, but I look at your Instagram stories and your fitness stuff, which makes me scream. But it looks really <laughs> good. How how is that all going? Yeah, good, good. Um, well, you heard I love cardio. Um, yeah. I don't mind the weights. I just prefer to, I sort of prefer to mix the two together. Um, but my gym in Sydney is going quite well. Um, it's nice to be your own boss. Um, it's hard when you're away, um, but, you know, business as usual. That's why you have a business partner and that's why you've got um, a really good member base. So, but yeah, it, it's all going really well. My body's still handling what I'm putting it through, thank God. So um, we <laughs> I pull back as I need to and I push when I want to. So it's um it's really good. My body's in good condition. There you that's go. Good. That's really it's, yeah, good to hear. And I guess that's a good uh, positive note for next WBBLO season at the moment. Um that's good to <laughs> good to <laughs> good to know. Yeah, well that's all we have for today. Obviously, really, really appreciate your time and um yeah, and and how open and honest you've been with us. It's been really great to hear. To hear thank you very much Courtney. Journey. yeah thank you thanks sorry it took so long <laughs> no that's no we worries. got there we got there yeah we, we've done it um we did we happy to chat anytime good luck with the rest of your wncl season um even though we are south australians we will be cheering on the tasmanian tigers I'll, I'll, i'd <laughs> like to see a 
SA versus Tassie final. That'd be a, a good one to see. Oh, that would be a good one. <laughs> Yeah, once again, thank you. Um, we'll let you get on with the rest of your night. And yeah, good luck with the rest of your season. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Good night. You too. Thanks, Gwedi. Thank Alex Blackwell, keep her up over the stumps. And bold. So Coit gets the breakthrough with her first delivery. And Alex Blackwell is out for nine. Well, amazing interview there with Coity. Yeah, we've known her for quite some time now. So it's, it, was, it was good to have that that chat and yeah like we said before it's it was a really insightful one and like I said during it it's it's something that someone could be going through the same thing and all you need is a voice a a voice of power really where they're at a professional level where their voice can be heard um and it, it can be just all the difference so just remember that if if you are struggling there are people that you can talk to family friends just make sure you reach out and there are many support lines as well that you can give give a call so that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Next week, we are joined by our first male cricketer guest, which is super exciting. So we chatted to Wes Agar, who is a Adelaide striker, South Australian Redbacks player. So we talked to Wes about lots of different things, ranging from his Australia debut, his first strikers game, and, and playing alongside his brother as well. So make sure you tune in next week because you don't want to miss that one. You can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at How's That TCP, or you can get in contact with us by email at How's That The Cricket Podcast at gmail.com. But that is all from me this week. And all from me. Hope you enjoyed, guys. See you next week. How's that? You missed the-